sort of a variant of wireless is something called Bluetooth. Now, they actually have two different uh, IEEE standards. Wireless is 802.11 something, 802.11 ABGN. Bluetooth is 802.15, but the concept is extremely similar and operates in the, uh, sort of the same band. Bluetooth, rather than having like a, a, a little short-range network that might go across a floor or across a building or across a parking lot or around uh, a, a, a conference area or something like that, Bluetooth is meant to have a little tiny, tiny network called a personal area network. And you've probably seen this symbol, the Bluetooth symbol, and you've probably seen a lot of these, Bluetooth headsets. So someone will have a phone that's Bluetooth enabled and they'll have a Bluetooth uh, earpiece here and they'll walk around and it can have a little mic here, the mic is here or whatever. And the Bluetooth headset makes a constant Bluetooth connection to the phone. But Bluetooth is not limited to just headsets and phones. You have Bluetooth keyboards so that the keyboard is completely wireless. You can have um, Bluetooth printers. You can have um, Bluetooth car keys and other remote control devices. It's meant for a very short range link, usually only within a room and usually only like a meter or three meters or possibly 10 meters. There are ways to extend it, but it's a little beyond the scope of this class. So Bluetooth is meant to be uh, very narrow. Just like wireless, it has all the same vulnerabilities. Default configurations. Now, the, the whole premise behind Bluetooth is when two Bluetooth-capable devices come in proximity of each other, they try to form an association automatically. Obviously, if you've ever used Bluetooth on a phone with your laptop, you have to say, yes, it's okay to form an association, but they try to do it. And if you don't configure Bluetooth carefully, you can have devices automatically forming associations. You don't even realize it, and now I'm stealing stuff off of the device. I'm stealing data, or I'm hacking into that device. Um, I, I have noticed that there are some trends towards using Bluetooth in automobiles, and that's fantastic. I'm concerned about all of the security risks that go with um, using Bluetooth or any other wireless uh, in an automobile and getting into a car or getting into a home or getting into a security system. So again, always security is a tug of war of convenience and functionality and performance against security. And you have to find something in the middle, uh, a, a balance in the middle. So the risks associated with portable and wireless things, one thing, data emanation. And this isn't just even wireless or portable. My very monitor is giving off um, electromagnetic signals. It is possible under certain conditions to pick those signals up and recreate a screen. So in highly, highly secure environments, they'll put something called a Faraday cage, which is basically a cage of wires, um, in the walls, in the ceiling, and the floor, so that emanations can't get past that. That's an extremely high security environment. But also, my wireless devices, they're transmitting on radio, you know, microwave frequency. They're, they're transmitting away, and it's possible to pick up the data that way. If it is a Bluetooth device, we could possibly hijack the session. So um, I, I have a connection between this device and that device, but some other device comes in and takes over my connection. Bluejacking, kind of like carjacking, but it's bluejacking. Blue snarfing. I make a, an association in the background and I start stealing contact lists and, and data off of it. Very, um, I mean, there are many tools uh, that will uh, allow you to do this in an automatic way and tutorials on the internet. And so a very common security risk. Um, or we're breaking the encryption, the WEP or the WPA encryption. We're cracking those for wireless connections. Or maybe we're connecting with data in plain text, or it's stored on the device in plain text. Then the device gets stolen, and now you can access the, the data there. The wireless devices and the, and the phones themselves can get viruses. Or we can have more classic um, hacking attacks called buffer overflows, where basically I wrote a piece of code for some part of an application and I didn't put security boundaries around the input that comes in, and now someone sneaks in malicious input. Uh, there's a whole mechanism behind it, but, but basically it's, um, uh, it, it finds a way to put in more and more and more and more input until the um, service starts paging out 
its own code and now bringing in the malicious code, and now the malicious code gets run in the, the, the privilege level of that service. Um, so, I mean, even the mobile devices, of course, certainly laptops, are going to be uh, vulnerable to that. One thing we can do, of course, is um, for wireless access, we can actually have SSL sessions over wireless just as easily as we can have SSL sessions and other kinds of um, encryption uh, over a wired connection. But then, of course, we have to worry about that we never required authentication or the pin to associate one Bluetooth device with another was still left at the default, one, two, three, four, or something like that. And then, of course, we have rogue wireless access points, not necessarily malicious, but users plug them in for convenience. And we'll have to go around with something looking for um, a wireless signal and try to find these rogue unauthorized access points. So these are all the risks associated with portable and wireless technology. And when you as a um, CISA are looking for this stuff, you want to see what is the wireless and portable and mobile security policy and all the procedures you have in place, and then go and prove it to yourself whether or not they're effective. And we'll prove it by scanning the network, scanning for um, wireless signal, scanning for Bluetooth, doing vulnerability scanning on all these devices, try to penetration test these devices. Even the ones that are secured, can we still break in? There, there are loads of tools that you can use, free and paid, uh, to do this. And you can hire services and people to do it. And um, in your own CISA team, you'll have people who will probably specialize in that, possibly you. And when we do penetration testing, we can either test something that we know very specifically, or we can just blindly just do what we call black box. Let me just see what I can discover. So you're going to want to do all of these things when you're trying to deal with network security. The last thing I want to share with you in this little section is something called the OSI model and the DOD model. It is a little bit arcane, but it is important to know it exists because it describes how networking is thought of uh, both in a theoretical and a practical level. And an IS auditor needs to know that information.